Okay, recording started. So hello everyone. Today we have Nati Cyber from IS Princeton with us. Hmm. Uh, just unshared. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. There's some there's something with my setting. It will soon be all right. Okay. Now the title disappeared. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We we do want a title. Uh yeah, so I guess he needs no introduction, uh, but we are very honored to have him in Symmetry Seminar as he's one of the fathers of, who provided us with the modern tools and language uh, to discuss these things in quantum field theory. Uh, so Nati, please uh, take it ahead from here. Yeah, I'll take it, but in just in one second, because yes. I have a problem. We're waiting. Okay, now I think it's going to work. Now it should work. Okay. Okay. So, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Uh, so, we cannot me. see any slides yet, Nari. Can you? Oh, you cannot? Nope. Again, Let me wrong. make you. I, I think I made no, you. no, I, that's fine. Don't worry. I'll get it straight in just one second. Now right. it should be. Yep. Yeah, Great. we can see. Good. So, first of all, thank you for inviting me. It's a great pleasure. And this talk can be given from many different perspectives, uh, more condensed matter, more math, more physics, kind of emphasize on the continuum of the lattice and the symmetries and the anomalies and so forth. And I had experience already giving similar talks uh, from different perspectives and different orders. And I made something based on the guess of what the audience would be like. And I'm not sure my guess was correct. So uh, I think the best way to handle it is you just if you got people ask questions, and the more questions there are, the easier it will be for me to to align the talk. So I'll talk about really three distinct topics. This is kind of a summary. Uh, first, I'll talk about emergent versus eminent symmetries. I'll define em eminent symmetries in a really simple example. Uh, in continuum field theory will be in the compact boson example. The next topic will discuss anomalies in internal in internal symmetries in the lattice model, kind of a, disproving some common misconceptions, which I will soon illuminate a list. And finally, if I have enough time, I give to the punchline, which is lattice models where lattice translation has an anomaly. And that translates, the lattice translation translates to eminent symmetry in the continuum limit. I'll define eminent symmetries. And the eminent symmetry will be an, will have an anomaly which reflects the underlying anomaly in lattice translation. So let's start from the very beginning. What's a symmetry? So for the purpose of this talk, I'll give you a very limited definition. And I know that some people in the audience uh, are familiar with that and use much fancier definitions which go beyond the framework that I will be talking about. So for the purpose of this talk, we have a unitary operator U and it satisfies the following requirements. It's unitary, it's, it's conserved, which means it commutes with a Hamiltonian. So U agent, so the time evolution does not change U and it maps local operators to local operators. So the first two requirements are true already in quantum mechanics. The third requirement assumes some kind of space and some notion of locality so that local operators are mapped to local operators. And it's very important that the, the action on the operator satisfies these two requirements. First of all, the operators are always in a linear representation. And second, it's faithful, which and I'll soon give examples where the Hilbert space is a in, in the projective representation of the symmetry group, but the symmetry group still acts linearly on the operators. And the faithfulness will also be important because we do not want to discuss uh, symmetries that don't act on operators. So that's the requirement of faithfulness. And these guys, all of these U's obviously form a group. So that's part of my definition. And we know many generalizations of these presentations. We can relax any of these conditions. We can generalize it in many ways, uh, but I'm not going to do it here. The second ingredient I'll be talking about is anomalies. And for the purpose of this talk, anomaly would be only a truth anomaly. I'm not going to discuss the others. 
And I'm trying to take the system, which has a global symmetry as I've just defined, and I'm going to couple it to background, classical background fields. These are not dynamical fields, so I don't integrate them in the path interval. And when you go to the literature and look at such examples of anomalies, you will find all, all sorts of statements. When I went to school, I learned that anomalies are associated with fermions. Systems without fermions don't have anomalies. And there was even a rationale for it. Second, so anomalies are associated with divergences, and therefore you need an infinite number of degrees of freedom. These two misconceptions are very common in the high energy community, mostly in the older generation, not in the younger ones. And the condensed matter people have their own misconceptions. They like to think of anomalies as signaling an inconsistency of the theory. The theory on its own does not make sense, and it makes sense only on the boundary of a bulk theory, and which is called this symmetry protected topological phase. So these three misconceptions are very common. I'm not going to elaborate on them, but all of them are completely wrong. And let's just this, give an example showing that they're wrong by considering the simplest anomaly. So we consider a two-level system. Today it's called a qubit with vanishing Hamiltonian. Operators are two by two matrices, but anything that can act on the Hilbert space. The global symmetry of the system is SO3. It's not SU2 and it's not U2. It's not U2 because the overall U1 is not important in quantum mechanics. And what we really need is U2 mod U1, which is SO3. The symmetry is realized projectively on the Hilbert space. This was first noted by Wigner in 1931. So the Hilbert space is in an SU2 doublet, but the global symmetry is SO3. And because of that, we cannot couple the system to a classical SO3 gauge field. We can, but we need to make more choices as we do that. Notice that there is no need for an infinite number of degrees of freedom. We can do it in quantum mechanics. In fact, we can do it in a two-dimensional Hilbert space. There is no issue of divergences, and there is no need for the bulk. And nobody is going to say that the two-level system is inconsistent. It's a perfectly consistent quantum mechanical system. Let's go to a slightly more elaborate example, which I'll come back again and again to throughout the talk, but let me put some background so that we are all on the same page as far as the notation. This is the free one plus one dimensional theory of a compact scalar field, so phi is identified with phi plus two pi, and it has two U1 symmetries, and since these are continuous symmetries, there's a conserved Netter current. This is the conserved Netter current, and since there are two U1s, there are two currents, momentum current and winding current. This is the high energy terminology. The condensed matter people call this one the charge and this one the vorticity. And these two currents have a mixed anomaly. And the statement of the anomaly in its simplest form, which was also the first to be discovered, is that while the corresponding charges commute, the symmetry is U1 times U1, the currents do not commute. The commutator of a winding and momentum symmetry has some derivative of a delta function on the right-hand side, known as the Schrödinger term. A more modern manifestation of the anomaly is the fact that defects associated with it have non-quantized charges, and I will discuss that soon in detail. This system, which is well studied, this is arguably the most studied quantum field theory, probably of the order of 100,000 papers or so enjoys T-duality, which maps the scalar field phi to a dual scalar phi tilde, inverts the parameter R, which is a coefficient in front of the Lagrangian, and exchanges momentum and winding, and all of us know this very well. Here is a map of the space of theories. We can vary the parameter R. So we have a one-parameter family of theories labeled by a continuous parameter R, goes from zero to infinity. And there are some special points, R equals two in my convention, is known as the BKT point. I'll soon talk about it some more. R equals root two is a Dirac fermion. R equals one will also figure in our story. This is where we have SU2 level one. And T-duality maps R to one over R, so it acts like that. And the theory has an exactly marginal operator changing, acting along the R direction. Now let's start modify it a little bit. The first modification we will do is go to the dual coordinate phi tilde, dual field phi tilde, and we want to explicitly break the winding symmetry. The, re the reason we want to do it is that in most, com in most commonly studied the lattice models, the winding symmetry is not present. So if it's not present, we can add an operator, 
to, we can add to the action an operator that carries winding, chart, winding number one. So now ignoring the discrete symmetries, we have only the momentum symmetry. What happens to this space of theories labeled by R? For R bigger than two, this deformation is irrelevant. For R less than two, this deformation is relevant. As a result, for R bigger than two, this de deformation is irrelevant and therefore it doesn't do anything. The model remains gapless. And the winding symmetry that we thought we break by turning on this operator actually emerges in, at, at low energies. This is to be contrasted with R less than two. Here, this deformation is relevant. And since it's relevant, it's important. And what it does is to gap the system. And this transition was the, between the gapless and the gap phase, known as the BKT transition, was the subject of a Nobel Prize. So I don't think I should elaborate too much about that. I do want to emphasize that the emergent Q1 winding symmetry that is emergent here is violated by, by irrelevant operators. So if we are not in the extreme infrared, but we go to slightly higher energies, we will see violations of the winding symmetry, but that's not present in the extreme infrared. Now let's modify the system slightly differently. And instead of adding cosine phi tilde, I'm adding cosine two phi tilde. As a result, so this is an operator of winding charge two. And as a result, the winding symmetry, which was originally U1, is now explicitly broken to Z2. What do we know about this system? Well, we should apply the same reasoning as before and ask when is this deformation relevant and when is it irrelevant? So now this deformation cosine two phi tilde is irrelevant in over a large range of R and it's irrelevant for all R bigger than one. So what we said before is still true. This phase is gapless and we have an emergent U1 W symmetry. For R less than one, this deformation is relevant. Since it's relevant, it gaps the system. So now we have a gapless phase here and a gapped phase here, separated by SU2 level one. It is interesting that for R less than one, the Z2 winding symmetry must be spontaneously broken. One way to see that is just to ask where are the minima of this action? This tells us that so the minima are at two different values of phi tilde and therefore the Z2 symmetry is spontaneously broken. But there's a more general, more abstract way of understanding that. We mentioned the, the mixed anomaly between the U1 momentum and the U1 winding symmetries. And this mixed anomaly lead to a tooth condition, something non-trivial must be there in the infrared to account for the anomaly. The way it happens here is that if we had a unique ground state here, namely the Z2 was unbroken, then there was no way for the low energy system to reproduce the anomaly between the Z2 of winding and the momentum symmetry. As a result, the Z2 symmetry must be spontaneously broken. So we see that by, just by simple reasoning of what are the symmetries, what are the anomalies, we already get a lot of dynamical information about what the system does. And again, I emphasize that the emergent U1W symmetry is violated by irrelevant operators also in this range of parameters. So everything I said so far is known for several decades. So now I'm going to talk about things which are a little bit more modern. Let us deform our system further. So we go back to the system that is deformed by lambda cosine phi tilde. So there's no winding symmetry. And I want to study it in the presence of chemical potential for the momentum symmetry. So the momentum charge is R squared over two pi phi dot. And expressing it in terms of the phi tilde field, it is this. So from the point of view of phi tilde, the momentum symmetry looks like a winding charge and that's why it has this form. And as we add a chemical potential, we can think of it as adding this term to the action. The cross term here is the coefficient times that charge. And then there's a constant which is not interesting. And I tune the chemical potential such that the minimum of the action is when the charge is around Q. And then there could be small changes in Q. And I have in mind turning very large chemical potential. Since this is a conformal field theory for lambda equals zero. So imagine Q is 10 to the 10th, really big in number. And we just want to study this system. So we start with lambda equals zero. 
Now, before we do that, let me just change variables to simplify. So I redefine phi tilde, call it phi hat. And this is the same action in terms of phi hat. So now let's set lambda to zero. When lambda equals zero, this term is absent. And we see exactly the same problem we started with. Should we be surprised? After all, we turn on the chemical potential. For lambda equals zero, the transformation from the phi tilde to phi hat is known as a, as a spectral flow transformation. And that maps the action to itself. So we shouldn't be surprised that for lambda equals zero, the fact that we added the chemical potential doesn't do anything. But now let's have both, both the chemical potential and break the symmetry to the, break the winding symmetry completely. So we have to ask ourselves, what does the perturbation by this operator do? Well, as we said earlier, this op depending on R, this operator could be either relevant or irrelevant. But either way, for large Q, it has very large momentum in space, not momentum charge, but not target space momentum, but a wall sheet momentum or momentum in one plus one dimensions. What this means is that this operator oscillates very rapidly as we move X. And therefore, it does not act in the low energy theory. Every metrics element between low energy states, or every metrics element of this operator between low energy states is zero because this operator oscillates so rapidly as a function of X. Nominally, as a local operator, this thing can be relevant or irrelevant, and the dimension could be even very small. Yet, it does not contribute for, when, when I integrate it over X, it does not contribute to correlation functions in the low energy theory. This is an example of what we can call an eminent symmetry. And I want to thank Tom Banks for suggesting this word. It was outside my English vocabulary. I had to look it up when he suggested it. And what we say here is that the system with a chemical potential has a winding symmetry, but the winding symmetry is not an emergent symmetry. It's an eminent symmetry. It emanates from UV translation. Operators, we can ask what kind of operators could violate our winding symmetry. First, we can add operators like cosine phi hat. So we consider this system and we ask, can it be deformed by cosine phi hat? It cannot because this violates the UV translation. So operators like cosine phi hat cannot be present in the low energy effective action. Well, what about these operators? After all, this operator is in the action. It doesn't violate any symmetry of the problem. This operator is indeed invariant under all the UV symmetries, including UV translation. UV translation shifts X and shifts phi hat, such that this combination, which we originally called phi tilde, is not shifted. However, this operator violates translation in the IR theory. And therefore, it has vanishing metrics elements between low energy states. Whoops. So the eminent symmetry, unlike an emergent symmetry, is not violated by relevant or irrelevant operator in the low energy theory. Notice that the low energy theory can have relevant operator that violate the winding symmetry, but these operators are not present. Looking differently, this, the system can have irrelevant operator while violating the winding symmetry, and even these are not present. So this is what I mean by an eminent symmetry. It's a symmetry that is there because it started its life as translations in the UV theory. And it's really a different notion than the notion of relevant versus of a, an emergent symmetry because which operator violates it or not, we need to do a different analysis and the consequences are different. We'll soon see more examples of it. Uh, I would like to move now to a lattice model of the same XY model, the same compact boson. Historically, I think this was the first way of writing it. Many people had worked on it before the classic paper uh, that I refer to here of Jose Kadanoff, Kirkpatrick, and Nelson in 77. There's a huge literature on this model uh, in condensed matter physics, in field theory, etc. And this is the action. This action can also, instead of having an action, we can also write the Hamiltonian. So time is continuous and space is, is a lattice. We have at every side, we have a momentum P, which is the momentum conjugate to a circle valued field phi at the sides. And this is the Hamiltonian. So this is the potential and this is the kinetic term. 
And there's only the momentum symmetry. There is no winding symmetry. So no winding symmetry and hence no anomaly. In fact, when I first learned about this model, I learned that, of course, there's no winding symmetry because the winding symmetry must have an anomaly and we cannot have anomalies on the lattice and therefore there cannot be any winding symmetry. For large beta, this model flows to the continuum theory with R, which is roughly of order root beta. For smaller beta, vortices can proliferate and the system is gapped. So this model, the continuum description of this model is precisely the model I presented earlier, where we talk about the C equals one compact boson theory and we deform it with cosine phi tilde interaction. Now, we would like to suppress the vortices in order to avoid the BKT transition. And again, there is long, complicated literature about it. I put some references. I'm sure there are many others. So we use a VLAN formulation of the model. We are still doing the action formulation. So we have phi's on the sides. They are, now they are real. No, they are not circle value. And we use a Z gauge theory. So we have integers on the links. And we write the VLAN action. And I didn't give reference to VLAN, but I gave the subscript here, which I think is fine enough. So this is our action. And this is action has a Z gauge symmetry. We can shift phi by an integer and we can shift the gauge field and mu by the lattice derivative of that integer. And then in order to suppress the vortices, all we need to say is that the field strength of this Z gauge field vanishes on the lattice. So this is a lattice statement in the continuum, a Z gauge theory always has vanishing curvature, but here we are on the lattice, so there could be a curvature here, some integer on the plaquette, but we set it to zero. In this case, we have both momentum and winding symmetry, exact steel duality. There is an anomaly, we can discuss the anomaly of this system, but I'm not going to do it here. Instead, I would like to do it using a Hamiltonian formulation. So what are we going to do? We need a Hamiltonian formulation of this Z gauge theory. So we go to a classic paper by Cogut and Suskind in 1975, and we present the Z gauge field of the VLAN model using an integer spatial gauge field. So in the space directions, we have the same N we had before, namely the, field, the gauge field with spatial components. And we pick the gauge n0 equals zero, so there is no time component of the gauge field. But instead, we have the momentum conjugate to n, which is the electric field. So the first two terms in the Hamiltonian are exactly as they were before. So I, I just replace phi by phi plus two n. And then we can also add cosine e, which is the analog of electric field square. And since the coordinate is quantized, because the gauge field is n, the conjugate momentum E is circle value. So these are the commutation relations. So this system is nothing but the Hamiltonian version of the VLAN action that I presented earlier. This is the Hamiltonian version in one plus one dimensions. Since it's a gauge theory and we work in, in temporal gauge, we need to impose Gauss law at every point. So at every point, we impose this Gauss law condition. You can check that this condition commutes with a Hamiltonian. So this Hamiltonian has a huge Hilbert space with a huge symmetry group, the symmetry that is generated by this element at every site. And we impose that we work only in the subspace where we work only in the subspace where this thing is one on every site. So this is our model and we can study this model, but we would like to suppress the vortices in this form, it's even easier to suppress the border system in the Euclidean version because we don't have to put any constraint. Instead, we just set G to zero and we remove this term. So the claim is that if we take the modified VLAN version that we had on the previous slide and we go to Hamiltonian formulation, this is the same as taking this Hamiltonian and not including the last term. Let's see how it works. So this is our problem now. We have phi, real valued phi at every site, conjugate momentum P, integer N on every link, and conjugate momentum E, and we impose this Gauss law. This is our system. It's easy to check that this system has both the momentum and the winding symmetry of the continuum model. The momentum symmetry has a charge, which is the sum, 
which is charge density is Jm, sum over the sides, and Jm is the momentum. You can check that this charge commutes with this Hamiltonian. It also has a winding symmetry, which is nothing but the Wilson line of the Z gauge field. And we can write it in a gauge invariant way. So we can write it as a sum over the links of the, in the gauge field, or we can add delta phi. These delta phi drop in the sum because they cancel between different links in the sum. But this way, the current is gauge invariant. So this model has two currents, Jm and Jw. More precisely, these are the time components of the currents. In the time component of the momentum current and the time component of the winding current do not commute. So here we see the anomaly on the logs. From this perspective, the anomaly is the statement that these two charges as operators, they commute. And the anomaly is captured by the fact that the currents are not commute, do not commute. There's a Schwinger term on the lattice. Instead of being delta prime in the, in, as, in the, as in the continuum, it is delta of i minus j, delta ij minus delta ij plus one, kind of two nearby, the chronic deltas of nearby sides. This model also has an exact T duality. We can write a transformation here similar to what is known in other cases. It exchanges the field phi with the field E, exchanges momentum and winding, and inverts R, R to one over R. So this model is very similar to what we saw in the continuum. But our goal here is to understand anomalies. That's why we are interested in this model. So we would, we've already seen that the anomaly is captured by the Schwinger term e between the two currents. Notice this is very much like in the continuum. There's a Schwinger term in the current commutator. Here we see the analogous thing on the lattice. The modern view of anomalies is that we should view anomaly by coupling to a background gauge field. So we're going to limit ourselves to flat gauge field, namely the field strength is zero. And then there are various complementary ways of thinking of the background gauge field. They're all related to each other in a straightforward way. We can change the Hamiltonian everywhere by adding background gauge field for either the momentum or the winding symmetry. That's one thing we could do. We could also not change it, in, not change the Hamiltonian, but instead introduce twisted boundary conditions on the fields, holonomy around various cycles. But the more useful way of thinking about it is in terms of topological defects. So we'll keep the boundary conditions as periodic, but we are going to change the Hamiltonian in a localized region, such as to account for the twisted boundary conditions. So instead of thinking of twisted boundary conditions, I'm just changing the Hamiltonian at one point. And this is the statement that we add a defect. The defect will have to be topological because otherwise it's not associated with the symmetry. And we'll see that very explicitly. More mathematically, we represent the background gauge field by putting having patches on our space time. Remember, our space is a bunch of points and time is continuous. So we cover it with patches and we need transition functions between the patches. And locally, the connection is zero, but all the information in the twist comes through the transition functions. And what we will see is that the global symmetry of the problem with the defect could be realized projectively even when the original Hilbert space is in a linear representation. In the problem we started with, without defects, the U1 momentum and U1 winding had integer charges. As we will soon see, that will change in the presence of defects. So how do we introduce the defects? This is our Hamiltonian. So this is a full problem. This is the Hamiltonian, and we have Gauss law that we need to impose, and we couple to background gauge fields for the global symmetry. And that's really straightforward. We have two terms in the Hamiltonian, this one and this one. And to introduce a momentum defect, namely a defect for the momentum symmetry, we shift this guy at one link by eta n, by a constant eta n. And a winding symmetry shifts the momentum at one side by eta w. So I, I didn't prove it, but I'm just claiming this is what it is. And this way we have defects both for the momentum and for the winding symmetries. And now we can explore their properties. First of all, the positions of these defects can be changed by unitary transformations. So if I wanna move the defect from one side to another, I can do that by conjugating the Hamiltonian by a unitary transformation. 
in the Hamiltonian formulation on the lattice that we use here, this is the counterpart of the statement that the defect is topological. As we do that, we can change the positions of the defects and the correlation functions do not change. That's a statement that the defects are topological. But there's an important counterexample, counter case to that when that's not the case. And that's when defects cross. When defects cross, we get a phase. So when we discuss a momentum defect moving this way and a winding defect moving this way, so we first move the winding defect to the right and then the momentum defect to the right, we get some answer. If we do it in the opposite order, they cross here and here. And when they cross here and here, there is an anomalous phase. So the anomaly is signaled by this anomalous phase. Another way of saying it is that in these crossing points, we have commutators of the currents that I mentioned earlier, and the current, the current commutator is non-zero, and as a result, we get this phase. But if not, you could just calculate and see that this is what we have. So as we try to move these defects around, so what, what do we mean? We have some flat gauge field. We describe it using patches and transition and overlap regions with transition functions. And now we have to check that it's independent of how we trivialize the bundle. So as we change the trivialization, we move the defects around. And we see that for small changes, nothing dramatic happens. But when the lines cross, I get a phase. There are other consequences of the anomaly. It's easy to check that the momentum defect labeled by the parameter eta m carries winding charge proportional to that value. And the winding defect carries momentum charge. So we see that both the momentum and winding symmetries are realized projectively in the Hilbert space of the defect. Another consequence of that is that without the defect, the system has a ZL translation symmetry. We have L sites with periodic boundary conditions. It's generated by shifting the system by one, by one site. The generator is called T. And if you raise it to the Lth power, we get one. So the global symmetry of the system includes ZL of translation. That's not the case when we have a defect, because when we have a defect, the system T no longer commutes to the Hamiltonian. T moves the, Hamil the defect from one site to another site. However, we said that T, the defect is topological. So we can shift the, we can use T to shift the whole system that shifts the defect by one side, but then we can combine T with the symmetry transformation that moves it back, moves the defect back to where it was. So the original translation symmetry is no longer a symmetry, it does not commute with the Hamiltonian, but the translation symmetry corrected by the defect is a symmetry of the Hamiltonian with the defect. So the system with the defect still has a translation symmetry. It's not the original generator, but it's the original generator dressed by the operator that moves the defects around. Now let's see what, what happens to this equation. This equation was a statement that the system has a ZL symmetry such that if we do a complete translation of space, we come back to where we started. That's not the case when we have defects, because when we have complete rotation of translation of space, we drag these defects around and we have to keep track of that. So the answer, this is the result of an explicit computation and it has two pieces. So first of all, it's not one. And the answer has two pieces. The first piece, this one is easier to understand. When we have twisted boundary conditions, and we go all the way around space, namely we rotate, we rotate the space completely, then what we get on the right-hand side is the group element by which we twist it, by momentum transformation and winding transformation. But So that's the first element. This is just group theory. The second element, this one, is an anomaly. I mentioned earlier that when defects cross, we get such a phase. And when we do it here with translation, we also have this anomalous phase. Now, all these phases can be redefined. We can redefine the charges by shifting them by constants. So we'll get rid of the phase here. We can get rid of the winding charge here or the momentum charge here. We can redefine T 
and then we could redefine these operators. We can change a lot, but one thing is important here is that we cannot get rid of all the phases. No matter what we do, we can redefine the operators and either the charges or the translation symmetry, we cannot get rid of all the phases and hence the anomaly. Are there any questions so far? Are people still there? Yes. Yeah, at least one person. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Two is a quorum. Uh, so now, what have we done so far? We discussed anomalies and symmetries. We discussed the uh, simple cases in quantum mechanics. And we discussed the compact bosons and various variations of it. We saw the notion of an eminent symmetry. So first we discussed emergent symmetries. Emergent symmetries are symmetries that are not in the UV. For some reason, all the relevant operators in the IR respect the symmetry. And then this is an emergent symmetry. The irrelevant operators do not respect the symmetry. And that's what we call an emergent symmetry. The emergent symmetry, I think, is more common in condensed matter. In high energy physics, it's more common to call it accidental. It's accidental because it so happens that there are no relevant operators that violate the symmetry. And that's why we have the symmetry, but it's not exact because it's violated by uh, irrelevant operators. Uh, then we, we contrasted that with eminent symmetries that are exact symmetries at low energies. They can be violated by, they, they can be relevant operators charged under them. Uh, but these operators are not present in the effective action. Similarly, they can be relevant. Op they can they cannot be any irrelevant operators that violate them in the effective action. So they are much better than emergent symmetries. I should emphasize that the eminent symmetries are not really a special case of the sorry. The eminent symmetry is not a special case of the emergent symmetries. This is a different notion, and which is often being confused in the literature. And then we discussed a lattice model for the compact boson, which has all the symmetries and t-duality and the anomaly between them. And we see everything already with a small lattice. In fact, we can for lattice with, site, with one site, this thing is very degenerate. There are no currents, and therefore the symmetry is there, but there are no anomalies. But as long as L is at least two, the discussion of the anomalies goes through. So we can see the anomalies of the compact boson in a lattice with two sites. And of course, with a larger number of sites, it's even more visible. But the anomaly has nothing to do with an infinite number of degrees of freedom. We see it on a finite lattice. So in the third part of the talk, I would like to uh, put a all question. Three. Yes. Uh, so you said eminent symmetries are not broken by irrelevant operators. Uh, does it mean I can extrapolate them to ultraviolet and think of them as symmetries of the whole theory? A, that's a very good question. And the answer is a strong no. If I look at the lattice model, the eminent symmetry is not a symmetry of the UV theory. It's not a symmetry of the UV theory. It's not a symmetry of the lattice theory. It's a symmetry that acts only in the low energy spectrum. So it's then, not well defined. Its action on high energy states is not well defined, and I will soon give an example of this. But this is very important. This is unlike an emergent symmetry. An emergent symmetry is right. the Sorry? Uh, oh, I had a question, but you can continue, keep going, finish what you were saying. Uh, so the as I raise the energy a little bit, the emerge the emergent symmetry is not there because the irrelevant operators kick in. And of course, it's not there at all distances. The eminent symmetry is not there at all distances. This is not a symmetry of the UV theory, as it wasn't in the example I presented. It is there at low energies. And if I raise the energy a little bit, it is still a good symmetry. It's not violated by irrelevant operators, number one. Number two, there can very well be relevant operators that violate the, the eminent symmetry, that are charged under the eminent symmetry. But these operators are not present in the effective action. So it differs from emergent symmetries in two ways. Number one, 
its exact flow energies, not violated by irrelevant operators. And number two, there can very well be relevant operators charged under the eminent symmetry, but they are not present in the action. Okay, so there was another question. Yeah, so I wanted to ask also about that. I mean, you say that this eminent symmetry is not present uh, on the in the UV on the lattice scale, but you do have this translation symmetry. That's correct. Like, why can't I just say that this eminent symmetry is for translation symmetry? Okay, so the, first of all, the, it's a group, it's not this. So first of all, the word emanate comes because the symmetry emanates from the UV translation. But the UV translation does not have that symmetry as a subgroup. It's not a subgroup of the UV theory. Well, okay, okay. Let me ask this. Ask it this way. Suppose I have a symmetry that microscopically has Z four system, but microscopically has Z four symmetry. But maybe some of the charges are, are gapped. So then you could say that in the IR it acts just as Z two, which is a quotient of the Z four. Would you call that an eminent symmetry, or is it just for no? That's the, that's, that's the Z2 symmetry is there. The, there you would say that there's a Z4 that does not act faithfully at long distances. Right, so why can I say that? There is, so this... there is a homomorphism from the UV to the IR. But uh, in the example I presented, there is no winding symmetry in the U, there is no U1 winding in the UV theory. Right, but this Z symmetry. So, so let's take you an example because I'm concerned that if I say more abstractly and more generally, it will be much more confusing. But there was one example that I mentioned earlier of the compact boson with a chemical potential with the operator that violates the winding symmetry. The long distance theory has a new eminent winding symmetry, which is not the same as the UV translation. It just doesn't act the same way. And I will soon show another example where we see an, an eminent Z2, and there it will also be clear that the symmetry is not there in the UV. So U1 does have a dense C subgroup. I kind of want to say that that is, that is the true. U1 does have a C subgroup, which is dense. Um, I want to yeah. just kind of want to say that because that is a translation symmetry. There are various, say, uh, So the, let, let, let me say differently. The example I mentioned earlier in the continuum can be repeated with this, within this modified Villain model in the Hamiltonian formulation. And there you can do it at finite A. And then everything is discrete. All these symmetries become discrete symmetries. And the eminent symmetry is a discrete symmetry. It's not U1 winding, but some discrete symmetry that depends on the feeling fraction or the chemical potential. And you can easily check that it's not a symmetry of the underlying lattice model. Who, who is asking this question? I can't see the faces. Sorry, this is me, Dominic else. Ah, hi, Dominic. Yeah. I thought this was you, but I wasn't sure. <laughs> okay, maybe I should continue. Uh, yeah. Sure. So I'm going to collect now all these ingredients to discuss the Heisenberg chain. And at this stage, I did not put any references except mentioning Heisenberg because these are literally tens of thousands of papers, if not more. So we have a lattice with L sites with periodic boundary conditions. And there is a Hamiltonian, which acts, so we have Pauli matrices, S, uh, with a, I put a half in the normalization, but that's just a matter of convention. And we have a sum of all the sites and sj dot sj plus one. So and as we go around, j is, is considered a periodic variable. So when we have here n plus one for j is one, it goes back to the first site. The global symmetry of the system is SO3. It is generated by the sum of all these s's and you can check that it commutes with the Hamiltonian. There is some, um, it's not the condensed matter literature is not clear on whether this symmetry is considered acting on site or not. Different people use different definition for the phrase on site. I will use a definition such as this is not on site because the SO3 acts projectively on every site. Some people like to call it still on site. And a lot is known about this system. At long distances, it flows to the SU2 level one WZW model. The same model we discussed earlier at r equals one. In fact, 
more is known that when L is even, when L is even, the total number of sites is even. So the total Hilbert space is a linear representation of this SO3. When L is odd, the number of sites is odd, and therefore the whole Hilbert space is in a half integer spin of the global SO3, or more precisely of SU2. So at L even, this model flows to the SU2 level one conformal field theory that we discussed earlier. And when L is odd, there's a odd, when L is even, it flows to that. And when L is odd, it leads to the theory center, a uh, twisted by the center element of SO4. So microscopically, in this case, the SO3, which is a subgroup of SO4, is realized projectively. So this slide is a summary of maybe tens of thousands of papers, if not more, but that uh, I still put it here for completeness. This whole thing smells like there's an anomaly here. And there's huge literature about describing it as an anomaly. This is a partial list of the works in the literature, starting with the classic work of Lieb, Schutz, and Mattis, generalized, uh, understood better and generalized by Oshikawa, extended further by Oshi Oshikawa, and a whole bunch of people analyzed it from various perspectives, including trying to phrase it as an anomaly. Uh, my problem with all that is that these are beautiful results. The first results were due to leap fruits and Maddox and were later interpreted. Many people said it looks like an anomaly, but I, for one, couldn't figure out an anomaly in what. And when we discuss anomalies in a tooth anomaly, this is something very specific. And we would like to rephrase this whole literature as a statement about an anomaly in the global symmetry. So as I said before, we are going to study anomalies by coupling the system to a background gauge field. And I'm going to limit myself to flat band background gauge field. The internal symmetry that I will be talking about is the SO3 symmetry. So we would like to subject the system to an SO3 background field. And we will do that by introducing a defect. Recall that I said earlier that there are different presentations of the background gauge field. We'd like to do it as a defect. The defect is associated with the group element of SO3, so that if we have twisted boundary conditions, as we move around space, we, we have a transition function with the group element of SO3. Instead, we'll put it in the Hamiltonian. So up to conjugation, which you can take this group element to be into the I sigma, times SZ, so it's one, it's U1 subgroup of SO3. And that has the property as a group element that sigma should be identified with sigma plus two pi because this is complete rotation in SO3. And sigma should be the same as minus sigma because it's conjugating by a rotation around an orthogonal axis, so it with the volume group. So these are the possible twists we can put. So as we go around space, we should put a defect somewhere associated with the parameter sigma, and the parameter sigma is the same as sigma plus two pi, and sigma is the same as minus sigma. It's very easy to write down the Hamiltonian. We pick one link, the link between j and j plus one. We don't write the s dot s. Instead, we write, write it explicitly. For sigma equals zero, this is the same as the original Hamiltonian. But for non-zero sigma, we see that we rotated the link by these phases. One way to think about them is by turning on background gauge field on the link, U1 background, or more precisely SO3 background gauge field on the link between J and J plus one. So we rotate here by E to the minus I sigma and here by E to the I sigma. We can check here the two statements we said before that sigma should be the same as minus sigma and sigma should be the same as sigma plus two pi. Especially focus on the, the latter one, it's clear from this Hamiltonian that this problem with the twisted Hamiltonian, sigma, only e to the i sigma appears. So sigma and sigma plus two pi should give the same answer. Now, I said that the defect should be topological. I mentioned it already when we discussed the lattice model for the compound boson. So we'll do the same thing here. Here I put the defect on the link j, j plus one. I can conjugate the Hamiltonian by this operator. And that moves the link, to the defect to be on the link between j plus one and j plus two. So there's a unitary operator that moves the defect around in space. Now for generic sigma, the SO3 symmetry is broken by the defect and it's broken to a U1 subgroup. 
whose elements are e to the i c s z. Right? This commutes with the group element for sigma, which was e to the i sigma s z. More mathematically, the defect is a group element g, and it breaks the symmetry to the centralizer of the group element that we pick. What about translation? It's very similar to what we said in the previous example. The original Hamiltonian has a symmetry operator T that moves sites from J to J plus one. That's no longer a symmetry because now we have a defect at a certain link. So if we act with this T after the action with T, the defect is on another link. However, we said that we can bring the defect back by conjugating the Hamiltonian by this operator. So this, this Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian with the twist, does not commute with the original T, but it does commute with this T. This T that shifts the defect by one thing, by one element. This twist operator has interesting properties. The first is that if we raise it to the elf power, we get e to the i sigma sz. We just add all these sz's of the various sites. That's what we said earlier, namely, when we go all the way around space, we shift t, we raise it to the t axis translation, we raise it to the elf power, what we get on the right-hand side is not one, but the group element of the twist, to which this is twisted boundary conditions. We shift the position, we shift the site by L, and that's the same as rotating by this group element. Equally interesting is the minus sign here. This t, if I shift sigma to sigma plus two pi, this is sigma, the sigma matrices over two, the Pauli matrices over two. So this is odd and the sigma goes to sigma plus two pi. It's very important that the, the full, if L is even, the full Hilbert space is in the linear representation of the SO3. The Hamiltonian is invariant under sigma goes to sigma plus two pi, but the symmetry transformation is not. It picks a minus sign here. Now, one could say, maybe I should redefine this T by putting here E to the I sigma over two, just putting the C number, it multiplied by E to the I sigma over two. This would be nice. It will remove the minus sign here, but it will introduce this minus sign elsewhere. So by writing it this way, we see that the project, the fact that the local Hilbert space on one side realizes the SO3 projectively appears as the way T, the translation symmetry depends on sigma. So this is the Hamiltonian, and we would like to compute the partition functions. So that what, this is the way we study a tooth anomalies. So a tooth anomalies are studied by subjecting the system or putting the system with background gauge field. We have some non-trivial background gauge field, and we compute the partition function in the presence of these gauge fields. So the partition function sigma tells us what the gauge field is in the space direction. Now we would like to put gauge fields also in the Euclidean time direction. So we compute a partition function, which is traced into the minus beta h. And what we can put here are the various symmetry operators that commute with the Hilbert space, which commute with the defect. This guarantees that our background is flat. So first we can put a twist in the time direction, Euclidean time direction, instead of putting a twist in the Euclidean, so let me step back. The twist in the space direction was introduced by the defect, which is labeled by this sigma that appears everywhere. T depends on sigma and the Hamiltonian depends on sigma. The twist in the Euclidean time direction is this operator, e to the i c z, instead of twisting the boundary conditions in the Euclidean time direction, I simply act with an operator. So what do we see here? Beta is the beta, the, the length of a time, or we can absorb it in the Hamiltonian. L is the number of sites. Sigma and Xi label the SO3 background gauge field. Sigma is the holonomy around space, and Xi is the holonomy around Euclidean time. And N, the integer N here, uh, probes the dependence of the system on lattice translation because the symmetry group of the system is both SO3 and lattice translation. And our goal is to see how this symmetry group, the or underlying SO3 and the ZL of lattice translation, what happens to that in the presence of the defect 
or alternatively, how does this partition function depend on the various twist parameters? And we should remember that n, we put the twist in n only in this time direction, not in the space direction. The reason, some, as we will soon see, and some people have actually suggested that the changing l, changing l here, is the same as a twist in lattice translation along the spatial direction. In many ways, this is true, but if you look in the details, you cannot make that precise. At least I couldn't make that precise. So sigma and C can be thought of as background SO3 gauge field, and N probes the lattice translation, and we do not explicitly put in any twist in, lattice, in the ZL of lattice translation in the partition function. And there are various ways of saying that that's not an ordinary gauge field. First of all, when we raise it to the L power, we see that it mixes with the SO3 symmetry. So the symmetries do not decouple. And there are other things like the ZL becomes ZL plus one, which is not a subgroup of ZL if we change the symmetry, we change L. In any event, the rules of anomalies tell us we should put the system in background fields and just compute the partition function and see what happens. And naively, this should be a, a, a function on the parameter space, which includes sigma, which was subject to sigma is the same as sigma plus two pi, and also the same as minus sigma. And C should be the same as C plus two pi and the same as minus C. And N should be the same as N plus L, because this is raising T to the L power should be one. So we can go through the trace expression and find various identities. I'll go through them quickly because I don't expect people to follow the details, but what do we see? We see that as we shift sigma by two pi, it's the same as not shifting sigma up to a phase that depends on what power of T would put in. If we shift C by two pi, it's the same as not shifting C, but with a phase that it depends on the total number of sites. And then there are two more relations that depend on charge conjugation and parity. So this is a bunch of collections, the partition function satisfies, bunch of relations that the partition function satisfies. And naively, the phases shouldn't be here because the theory is a function depends on sigma in some range and n in some range and c in some range with various periodicities. But instead, we get these phases here. The fact that we get the phases here means that z is not a function of the parameter space. The thing can be thought of as being a section of a line bundle. But the important thing is that it's not a function of the parameter space. We shift sigma by 2 pi. The Hamiltonian didn't change. Nothing changes. And yet, we don't find exactly the same answer. We get the same answer up to a phase. So this is the way we think of anomalies. And as another side of it, we can see that, and I mentioned it earlier, we could redefine the operators. Wherever we see t, we could put t times e to the i sigma over 2. That would get rid of this phase. Alternatively, instead of doing that, I can put a, a counter term here, a counter term in the Hamiltonian, or just put a phase here in my definition of the partition function. And this is common in anomalies that by adding counter terms, we can move the anomaly around rather than being in one place, it will be in another place. So we can redefine the operators and change the phase, but the main point is we cannot get rid of them completely. And you can go carefully through this list. You can get rid of this phase, but you introduce it elsewhere. You can get rid of this phase and introduce it in, late in other places. So the first, the phases represent a mixed anomaly between what? The anomaly is between the SO3 symmetry and lattice translation. So this is an exact statement on the lattice. We can check it on the partition function with L equals 10. It, we don't need to take any continuum limit. There's an exact anomaly. The way a truth defined anomalies, or maybe I should say the modern way of thinking about the truth anomalies, there is such an anomaly. And there's a mixed anomaly between the internal SO3 and lattice translation ZL. And that's true without taking any continuum limit. This is true if you just solve the problem on the two-dimensional, uh, on the lattice with two sides, you can very easily write explicit expression for all these partition functions because the system is easily solved. And you can check that these phases are there. So now let's see, learn more about these anomalies. 
the anomaly is that in, if there's relations in the partition function that I presented earlier do not depend on the details of the Hamiltonian. They depend only on the symmetries and the, the structure of the local Hilbert space. So in particular, they are independent of beta. The phases are, there are all the relations are independent of beta. So I can make beta very large. And by doing that, I zoom on the low energy states and the phases should still be there. These are the Atukt anomaly matching. In order to reproduce these phases in the low energy theory, the low energy theory cannot be trivial. As a result, for large L and low energies, either the translation symmetry is spontaneously broken or the theory is gapless. Otherwise, there is no way to reproduce these phases. This is the Lipschitz matrix theorem. And using this reasoning, we recover many known generalizations of Lipschitz matrix. First of all, we discussed SO3. It's enough to discuss in O2 subgroup. I made a mistake here. This is O2, an O2 subgroup of it, or it's enough even to have a Z2 times Z2 subgroup of it. And various people said that. It can also be generalized to higher dimensions. And this entire literature can be phrased using these partition functions and defects of the system with defects the way I described earlier. And we also analyze many other examples which are not in the literature. Let me go briefly through one of them. We can take the Heisenberg chain and change the coefficient of sigma z of s z s z. Put a parameter here lambda z. For lambda equals one, we get back the original system, which was the Heisenberg chain. So the global symmetry is only O2 subgroup of SO3, and this model is exactly solvable. And we know that when lambda z between minus one and one, it flows to the free compact boson with R z bigger than one. So for lambda z equals one, it maps to R equals one. And for lambda z going all the way to minus one, it maps to R going all the way to infinity. And the discussion I had before can be just copied. Now, there's no change. We have the same twist by sigma, the same partition functions, and the same relations between them and the same phases. Okay, so these are the good news, but now comes the puzzle. Why are these models robust or stable? We mentioned that the model microscopically has only SO3 symmetry. This model has only O2 symmetry. So there could be various operators in the low energy theory that violate the O2 symmetry, that, sorry, that preserve the O2 symmetry, but do not preserve the full winding symmetry. Specifically, if the radius is small enough, including in particular R equals one, which corresponds to the Heisenberg chain, the spectrum contains relevant operators that preserve O2, but do not preserve the full symmetry of the infrared. There in, at, the, at the SU2 level one, there's an operator with dimension a quarter or a quarter. So the dimension is a half. It is invariant under SO3, and of course invariant under the O2. It's very relevant, but it's not there in the spectrum. The spectrum remains gapless. So we claim that the model flows to this one model that I discussed earlier, which is the a compact boson deformed not by cosine phi tilde that violates the symmetry, but by cosine two phi tilde. So the symmetry is violated only by operator with dimension with winding charge two. So we claim that the model does not has an emergent U1 winding, but more important, it has an eminent Z2 symmetry. So the Z2 symmetry is eminent for several reasons. One of them, it, an operator like cosine phi tilde, which could be relevant, is not present in the low energy effective action. And in fact, it's not even present for higher values of N. As long as N is odd, there could be such irrelevant operators here. They are also not present. And this eminent symmetry violates the winding. A, this, and this eminent symmetry excludes all these winding operators. How, did this, how does this symmetry arise? How does it emanate from the short distance theory? And this is related to Dominic's question. The low energy theory has a ZL symmetry, let's not even put any twist, generated by T. At long distances, this T 
is C inverse C is a Z2 symmetry. I wrote the, the generator here, times E to the two pi I P over L, where P is the momentum of the continuum theory. So I claim that this formula is an exact formula, and it gives us a map between the lattice symmetries and the continuum symmetries in a way that I hope the Dominic would be satisfied, because this, this exactly addresses the question he asked me earlier. So let's unpack this formula and describe it in more detail. So this is lattice translation. This, the left-hand side of the formula is true on the lattice with L sides. The right-hand side of the formula includes continuum val values of the states C and P, and L appears only here, only in one place in the formula. So, P is the, so for a continuum person, no problem. We know what C is, we know what P is, and we can calculate these eigenvalues for all the states in the spectrum. But on the lattice, the right-hand side is not well-defined. T is meaningful and QM is meaningful, but there's no QW on the lattice. Only T, only a, this T and this QM are meaningful on the lattice. QW and P are not meaningful. So in the continuum, both P and C are separately well-defined, but on the lattice, P is not well-defined and QW is not well-defined, but T and QM are well-defined. However, at energies below, at energies of order one over L, both P and C are well-defined, and they're well-defined without any ambiguity. Furthermore, this relation I claim is an exact relation. So if I'm a continuum person, I know what C and P are for every state, I substitute it in, and a priori, it's on the lattice, there could be, this is order one over, this is order one, this is order one over L. There could be corrections of order one over L squared, but I claim that these corrections are not present because such corrections will ruin the fact that T to the L is one. So this is an exact formula for the lattice data, and it can be checked analytically for small values of L and numerically for larger values of L, and it works beautifully. So the conclusion is that this C generates an eminent symmetry, not an emergent symmetry. QW is an emergent symmetry, but e to the i pi QW, namely QW mod two, is an eminent symmetry. It's not there on the lattice. There is no such Z2 on the lattice, but for, for large and finite L, there's an unambiguous Z2 that acts on the low energy states. So more precisely, we said before that L even and L odd give different answers. In fact, the limit for large L depends on L mod four. So the easy statement is that for L even, we get the free compact boson. And for L odd, we get the theory twisted by these Z2 elements. Already here, there's an interesting subtlety. The twisted theory, both in the twisted theory, both the U1 momentum and the eminent Z2 act projectively. In particular, this C squares to minus one in the twisted theory. That's true in the continuum and that's true on the lattice. That's the reason we wrote C inverse here rather than C, because if C square is one, there's no difference between C and C inverse. This means that the Z2 symmetry, we said that microscopically we had an anomaly between the ZL of translation and uh, the SO3 global symmetry. Now, out of the ZL of translation, an eminent Z2 symmetry comes out. It emanates out of it through this formula. And the anomaly between the mixed anomaly between the ZL and the SO3 becomes a mixed anomaly between the continuum Z2 and the SO3. And this is the continuum limit of the SO3 slash ZL lattice anomaly. That's what we just said. And that's the Lipschitz lattice anomaly. So the Lipschitz-Mattis anomaly was, is an exact statement on the lattice, no limit, exact statement, which is a mixed anomaly between SOL and lattice translation. This ZL lattice translation becomes at large L, a con almost continuum U1 or ZL. And in addition, there's a Z2 eminent symmetry. And the mixed anomaly here of the lattice problem becomes the mixed anomaly between the Z2 and the SO3. Now, I said that the answer depends on L mode four. I'm not going to explain it here, but there's a more subtle anomaly, which the, 
The Hilbert space depends only on L mod two, but the way C, the eminent symmetry acts on the Hilbert space depends on L mod four. And that translates in the continuum to a self anomaly of the eminent Z2. There are more questions, I'm, I'll be happy to explain that. So I'm running out of time, let me summarize. Microscopic translations, for example, lattice translation, can lead to an eminent symmetry. We, show an we saw an example of that in the continuum where we put a chemical potential in the C equals one compact boson perturbed by the winding operator. And we also saw an example of that in the Heisenberg chain or its deformation. And that notion of an eminent symmetry is different than the notion of an emergent symmetry. It's exact at low energies. It's not violated by relevant or irrelevant operators. There could very well be relevant operators charge under it, but they are not present in the low energy action. Now, to get rid of the misconceptions, anomalies are not specific to fermions or an infinite number of degrees of freedom. We showed an example with one qubit in quantum mechanics. We also showed an example of a lattice model with finite L. So there's a Hilbert space, the infinite is, the Hilbert space is larger, but there's only L sites and there's no infinity and there are anomalies and they can be probed using defects in their properties. To this get rid of another misconception, anomalies do not signal an inconsistency of the theory. There's no need to add a bulk to the theory in order to make sense of it. And we had simple, simple lattice models exhibit anomalies, even for a finite lattice. This kind of demonstrates the points above. Again, no need for a bulk, no need for infinities. And we also saw anomalies involving lattice translation, and they lead to anomalies and eminent symmetries. So this point kind of combines the first one, the notion of eminent symmetry, with the discussion of anomalies. And that leads to lipschultz matics type theorems. They can be phrased in that way, that there's a mixed anomaly between lattice translation and internal symmetry, which become an anomaly between eminent symmetries and the internal symmetry. And related to that, I did not discuss it here in detail, but the Lattinger theorem and feeling constraints can also be phrased in this language. The example with the chemical potential that I presented was the first non-trivial example in the talk was an example of that. So I'll stop here. Thank you. So thank you, Nati, for this nice talk. Uh, are there other questions? I have a question, if you can hear me. Yes, I can. Hi, Nati. Thanks for a great talk. Uh, did I understand correctly? Uh, my understanding is that eminent symmetries will not emanate in ground states which break translation symmetry, like dimerized. Is that correct statement? I'm not sure about that. It's a very interesting question. I, I, I'm not sure about the answer. It could very well be that they do, but I'm not sure. I see, because my impression was that that uh, they they have a when they have a, a when the ground state or low energy states have a small overlap with the operators which break the symmetry. The operators which break the symmetry have high momentum. Uh, yeah. but, but for example, in, in this case, they are not invariant under translations by one lattice unit. In the last case you gave, that yeah. was my impression. And therefore, they have no overlap with ground states. But in the ground states which break translation by one lattice unit, like a dimerized state, uh, I would think that they don't emanate. OK, so let, let, let's go back to this example. So I'll explain that in the, in the O3 model. So let's see if I can do it here. There's something wrong with my setup. Um, The Heisenberg model flows to this type, to this theory, right? The Heisenberg model or, or its XXZ analog flows to this theory. So what did we say here? We said that this is the Heisenberg chain and this is the XXZ chain flows to this. And then there is an eminent Z2, no question. In this phase, I said that there is a Z2, but it's spontaneously broken, right? Right. So the, right that, that's what this model does. And the claim is that the Heisenberg chain flows to this model. So for large value of R, R bigger than one, uh, there's an eminent, there's a Z2 here, and there's an, an emergent 
uh, U1W. On this side, the Z2 is spontaneously broken, right? The Z2, the winding Z2 is spontaneously broken, and therefore there are two degenerate states. And I emphasize that we can understand why the symmetry must be spontaneously broken and why there are two degenerate states. That follows from a mixed anomaly between the Z2 symmetry and the U1 momentum symmetry. I said that when we talked about that. Now, how do we interpret that from the Heisenberg chain point of view? From the Heisenberg chain point of view, the Z2 that appears here is an eminent symmetry. The anomaly is an anomaly between the microscopic ZA and the U1 momentum, or the O, it's actually O2 momentum or a, the full SO3. And the fact that in the Heisenberg chain, if I just go below R equals one and looking at the XXZ model without that value of lambda Z, then indeed lattice translation is spontaneously broken. And I see the eminent symmetry is the symmetry that the low energy observer would say, I don't know anything about lattice translation, but I see an eminent Z2 and that eminent Z2 is spontaneously broken. So the more detailed answer to your question is that the Z2, the eminent Z2 exists also in the phase where the lattice translation, where the lattice translation is spontaneously broken. The way the anomalies work is, is slightly more subtle there. Thank you. So I have a question. I'm confused about the distinction between emergent and eminent uh, in an example. So consider a full dimensional theory, which, which is gapped and uh, deconfines in the infrared. Then in the infrared. I can't, I can't hear you very well. Maybe others can. I, there's some echo. There is some some kind of uh, technical issue. Maybe you mute yourself, unmute yourself. Uh, okay. Is it better now? No. Um, no. But say maybe I'll understand. I'll make an effort. Uh, right. So we have a four-dimensional gauge theory, which is gapped and deconfines in the infrared. Uh, and so in the infrared, we have a discrete gauge theory as the effective theory. Uh, in this case, there is a higher form symmetry in the infrared, which is not present in the ultraviolet. Yeah. So should I call this an good, eminent good, symmetry? Good question. Good question. So you can ask more. Yeah, good. So let, let me give an, in, 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 an even easier example. Uh, let's take QED with massive electrons. So at short distances, we have both an, only a magnetic one for symmetry. And at long distances, we have both an electric and a magnetic one form symmetry. Mm -hmm. So the magnetic symmetry, one form symmetry was there to begin with. So it's a symmetry end of story. I think the question you asked me is, should I think of the uh, electric symmetry, at QED at low energies, energies below the electron mass, should I think of it as an, as an eminent symmetry? Is that true? Is that your question? Mm, no, here I had a discrete gauge theory instead in the infrared. But I think it's the same thing. Okay, maybe. Uh... It's often the case, so let me first give the answer and then say it's often the case that when you have a pure gauge theory at long distances, it has higher form symmetry, and the higher form symmetries are not present in the UV. And these higher form symmetries are also exact at low energies. They are not violated by any irrelevant operator. Mm -hmm. Right? So the example that you mentioned is with a discrete symmetry. The example I mentioned is is in a weakly coupled theory, so there's no puzzle about if it's gap or not, I can just calculate, uh, and that's what it is. Uh -huh. And in that case, there is indeed, the higher form symmetry is, is indeed an exact symmetry at long distances. Uh -huh. And however, it differs from the emergent symmetry in the details. In particular, the, emer the eminent, sorry, it differs from the eminent symmetries in the detail. The, Eminent symmetry started its life as an exact symmetry with a different group. It started its life, say, as lattice translation. Mm -hmm. As a group, it's a different group. The two groups have nothing to do with each other. Mm -hmm. The ZL of translation has nothing to do with the Z2 that we come up with in the end. It's not a subgroup of it. Yeah. In a way, it's kind of a quotient of it, but it's not a subgroup of it. Mm -hmm. Also to address a Dominic's point. A, that's not the case for the higher form symmetries. 
So the similarity between these two is that the higher form symmetry is also exact in the sense that it's not violated by any local operator, relevant or irrelevant, mm -hmm. but there's also no local operator that acts on it, that, that is charged under it, because there's no local operator charged under the high form symmetry. Whereas the eminent symmetry is, is more dramatic because it has, there are local operators that are charged under it, but they are not present in the action. That, that, this is the difference between these two. I should mm -hmm. emphasize that uh, the fact that there are internal symmetries that started their lives as lattice symmetries is very well known. It's well known from when I studied physics, which was a long, long time ago, this was already a, a well-known old result. So that's not new. The new thing is how it acts on relevant and irrelevant operators and how we should think about anomalies in these symmetries. So if we have a symmetry that exists, both internal symmetry that exists both microscopically and macroscopically, we just use a tooth anomaly matching. That's what the tooth did. If we have an emergent symmetry at long distances, it might or might not have anomalies. But even if it has anomalies, it does not reflect the property of the UV theory of the UV theory because this symmetry is not there. The, the importance of the notion of eminent symmetry here is that an anomaly in an, M, in an eminent symmetry should be visible in the UV. The symmetry is not there, but there's another symmetry, in our case, it was lattice translation, from which the eminent symmetry emanates. And that symmetry can have anomalies. Thank you. And that's not the case with the, with the higher form symmetry. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question. I wonder whether there is an extreme example that uh, the continuous translation symmetry in field theory can be viewed as an eminent symmetry of a discrete lattice translation yes. of lattice theory. Yes, so the, the answer is yes. In, in our paper, we describe, uh, in the last section of our paper, we discuss exactly that. Namely, I we, we do it both in the continuum and on the lattice. The, on the lattice, you can do it with finite end. So you look at the same model that I discussed here. Let me get, get to it. There's something wrong with my, my mouse. We go to this model on the lattice and with finite L and we can put the chemical potential the same way we did in the continuum and analyze the symmetries and and break the winding symmetry on the lattice. So we break the winding symmetry by adding here cosine, uh, cosine E. So I can actually go back where the model was with E. Okay, so we go back to this model on the lattice. This is the XY model written in the Hamiltonian formulation using VLAN variables. So we go back to this model and we add the chemical potential in this model. So it's complete on the lattice and there's no winding symmetry. And then you can repeat an exercise very similar to the one that I presented here in the continuum. All this is in our paper, it worked out both on the lattice and in the continuum. And what happens there is that the lattice translation is ZL and the chemical potential uh, has some feeling fraction, which is in general, some rational number, call it a, R over S, and depending on the denominator S, the eminent symmetry is a different discrete subgroup of the winding symmetry. So this is worked out there, please. So it's exactly as you anticipate. I guess this is Shogun. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, it's, it's exactly as you anticipated, and you, you can work it out very explicitly using this model. I see, I see. So in the trivial case, uh, uh, maybe just a lattice translation just became continuous translation. But in this example, the lattice translation became continuous translation and plus some internal symmetry. That's right. They but it's not the full internal symmetry. symmetry. That, that's completely okay, right. Yeah. But it's yeah. not the full internal symmetry. The that's full right. internal yeah. symmetry has U1 of winding, but that gives yeah. only a Z2 subgroup. Okay. Yeah. Or in here, this thing with the chemical potential can give a Z 
said R over S and ZS subgroup of it comes. Yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you. Yeah, the last translation can become so many different things. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. So the, the thing is that when you ask, if you have a group, so imagine you're, yeah. you're a mathematician, you don't know anything <laughs> about these lattices and so forth. You have a group ZL and you ask, what is the L going to infinity limit of the group? <laughs> and the answer is not unique. It depends on which representations you keep. If you keep all the representations with ZL charge of order one things that transform like e to the i, number of order two pi i, an integer of order one divided by L, then the group becomes U1. If you okay. keep four possible charges, the group of Z, the limit of ZL is Z. And if you keep things that are localized at different values of the ZL charge, then you can also get an internal symmetry in addition to the U1. Yeah. And that's exactly what happens here. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hi, I, I had a question. Oh, do you want to go first? No, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I was wondering if eminent symmetries are special to lattice translations or if they can also come from other lattice uh, transformations, such as rotations. Ah, excellent question. I believe the answer they can come from a, also from, well, there are examples where they come from rotations. A, I don't know to what extent there's a complete understanding of that. A, but let me tell you where people come close to discussing it. A, there are this whole discussion of classification of SPT phases of a, internal symmetries. And related to that, a more modern discussion, I think Lee Dominic was one of the pioneers in that, that there are lattice symmetries which acted as far as the classic, there could be an SPT phase associated with lattice symmetries a, called crystalline symmetries. And the classification of them is conjectured to be similar to the classification of internal symmetries, as if the crystalline symmetry is just an internal symmetry. I do not know to what extent that was proven, but there's a very concrete and explicit statement in the literature with lots of examples. And I think what must be the case is that this crystalline symmetry indeed becomes an internal symmetry, but it becomes an eminent internal symmetry. And that can include translation or rotation and so forth. Maybe Dominic can shed more light on that, but I do not know whether this was actually worked out in detail. Okay, I see. I don't know if Dominic is still there, but uh, he wrote on papers on that. I mean, it okay. It, whether it's proven depends on your definition of, of proof. I mean, I think there's strong evidence for it, but I'm not so clear on how exactly this is related to eminent symmetries. I mean, I, it seems like there was some specific thing you were saying about that. I, I would not be surprised if your paper can be phrased using the language of eminent symmetries, and which will explain why it acts as an internal, as an anomaly in an internal symmetry. I don't yeah. know if people have done it or not, and I have not done it myself either. This is my hunch. Yeah, I'm not so sure about that, but anyway, we can talk another time. Okay, I'm not sure either. I thought you would know, but if you don't know, then okay, this is something that to be worked out. So, so this would be specific with the crystalline equivalence principle. I think that's what it's yeah. called, right? Yeah, that's what I'm referring to. Okay, I see. Yeah, thank you. This is interesting. Okay, any time for one more? I can, uh, um, uh, thanks for a beautiful talk. Um, one thing, so back when I was youngish, I was told that the reason for this funny two the cosine two phi in, in XXC um, came precisely from translation symmetry. And, and I, I just want to add, I mean, I don't think what they said in the old days was wrong. I, I, clearly you've, you've clarified the situation greatly, but the way I think it was always explained to me is, okay, clearly there's translation symmetry, but also yeah. clearly in the ordered phase, you've spontaneously broken it. So this hinted yeah. at that. Yeah. And I'm so it's always just sort of, Explain to say, ah, when you identify the lattice operators with the field, you have to take a two-site unit cell. Yeah. And so thus translation symmetry 
uh, on the lattice becomes an internal symmetry in the field theory. That's correct. So that's all very hand wavy, but yeah. I don't think anything I just said is contradicted by what you said. Is, it, right. is that right? Who's, talk, who's talking? I can't see your name or face. Oh, hi, I'm Paul Fenley. Yes. Yeah, so. Oh, hi, Paul. Yeah. yeah. So what you, what you know is completely right. And in fact, related things had been said earlier in the, con in the context of fermions on the lattice, where the fermion mass term is allowed, is in, a transforms under an eminent symmetry, and it's not present in the effective action, and that's why the fermions are massless because a, because of lattice translation. So exactly the same the same thing you said was said. It must have been in the sixties or seventies. If there's anybody, yeah, I think this was eighty. Me, this was like Affleck and Haldane, I think said. Yeah, this but I'm, I'm talking long before that. I'm talking yeah. about. Yeah, okay. Fermions on the lattice is exactly the same thing. Okay. There is kind of an, in modern terms, I would say that there's an eminent Z2 chiral symmetry. Okay. And the eminent Z2 chiral symmetry excludes the mass term because the mass term of the continuum carries large momentum with respect to the lattice translation. And so that's why the mass term is absent. And okay. the model so, yeah, exactly the same. Uh, it's exactly the same thing. And it was oh. done earlier. I, I don't know if there's anybody from that era in, in the talk, but I okay. think this is already in the original paper of uh, Saska and then others. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, basically, so you've turned the new. It's not new, and it does not say anything that was not known. Okay. No, no, but so you've turned a sort of vague statement. Oh, when you take the limit, the fields become this and that, which is... It's true, but but not super precise. Yeah. To, to now a precise statement about about symmetries and how yeah. they behave. So yeah. the, no, so this and, is but, really progress. But okay, but it doesn't contradict anything. It just no, it does not contradict clarity. anything. And I agree with what you said about the precision, but there's a yeah. consequence of that because once the symmetry was better understood, we could discuss anomalies in a much on a much firmer footing. Yeah. Because we know exactly which symmetry we are talking about. So it almost, I think that almost everything I said, not almost, a large fraction of what I said in this talk is in one form or another already in the literature. And many of these things were also put, sort of put together in this order. I checked with many people and I read many papers. I did not see this particular presentation. No, I mean... It's probably, again, implicit in people doing topological defects because, you know, exactly like you said, you drag them around and you get funny things. But then, you know, you can make it, it, it comes in with modular transformation. I mean, what you the T to the yeah. L is a modular yeah, transformation. Well, and, and this is in the continuum. This yeah. is in the continuum, not on the lattice. No, no, we, we, we have a paper too. You can do modular transformations on the lattice too. So we did this with like icing defects. You yeah, can only T, only the T transformation, not the S transformation. No, S is just changing space, and you do this in a two D classical system. Ah, uh, so. in a two D classical system, and then you, you take the Hamiltonian no, 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 I limit. Think, like, I was thinking about this Hamiltonian formulation. Yeah, yeah so you can do all this, and you can match icing yeah. model partition. I mean, yeah. so so again, what you, you've done is not the example we did, but I mean, you can do it, and we did it. Yeah, right. No, no, I they. Putting twisted boundary conditions either in the continuum or on the lattice, this is a very old story. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That's and that's ancient. Twisted boundary then, conditions. Then, well, what I think hasn't been done much is this this the Dane twist on the lattice in the presence of these twisted boundary conditions. So then, you know, you you drag the th the yeah. the so defect in the other. Thing, so, so, yeah. So let's talk about that. So yeah, yeah. the fact that when you rotate. I have a formula here that I can point to. Yeah, so when you look at the presence of a twist and you look at T to the L, the fact that what appears on the right-hand side is the group element of the twist, this formula is known. And, and it's known in the Oberfeld literature and it's known in various other papers on twisted boundary conditions. Right. Th this is complete translation of space or the T transformation. And that is the group element of the twist. The fact that this relation can be realized projectively 
I have not seen it in this particular language, but I would not be surprised if even this is present in the literature somewhere. Yeah. Well, it's probably implicit in various places. Yeah, I don't know anybody wrote it sure. clearly. Yeah, like implicit this. for sure. But the nice thing here is that you really ask, what is the group in the presence of the defect? There's a defect, there's a group that acts, and the group has relations. And there are some relations among all these parameters. So when I look at the at these partition functions, these are the complete list of partition functions. This is the complete list of partition functions I could study with all possible twists, and they should satisfy some relations. And the naively, the relation should be satisfied on the nose, but instead we have these phases. Yeah. The phases, which are the anomalous phases. And as I said, we can move them around. So for example, when you shift N by L, this is the same as shifting C by sigma. This is the transformation T that you mentioned uh, in the icing model, yeah. right? The tau goes to tau plus one. This is this transformation yeah. on the lattice. So we chose the phases here such that there's no anomalous phase here, but there is a phase here. We could get rid of the phases here. Yeah, yeah sure, sure, sure. At the expense of putting them here. So the fact that, so for free fermions, for instance, or the compact bosons, all these are theta functions. And the theta function satisfied such identities from the, I don't know, it's the 18th century, whatever it was known, yeah. including the, the anomalous phases. It wasn't interpreted as an anomaly. Yeah. No, right. So, just, yeah. So, for icing, for example, you do this and you can get all the different sectors in the CFT partition function yeah. just by doing yeah. exactly the kinds of relations there. And right. what's nice, they're all, all completely explicit and exact yeah. on the lattice. Again, That's just right. like, like you did right. there. Case, and, then, and then, so you can match lattice and continuum. That's correct. Perfectly. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think that in that case, there's no anomalous phase. Yeah, probably not. So, because there's no anomaly in the system. There's no anomaly. There's no anomaly in that system. So what what happens here is that we have a system that has an, an first, okay. So one limitation: we cannot use all the symmetries of the infrared because some of the symmetries might not be present on the lattice. Right. And then there's the business of the eminent symmetry. So we should also use them. And putting all these together, there can be phases. So in the case of Ising, there are similar relations for various twists, but there are no phases. There's no anomalous phase. Where in the case of the Heisenberg chain, there are phases due to the anomaly. Also in this modified Guillain version that I presented earlier, there are these phases. So the anomaly is the statement of the phases. Yeah, I think that's, I, I have to think, but that sounds right. Because there aren't any sort of continuous like you want kind of things you can do in icing that I think that's crucial to no 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 that's not crucial because as I said here you can do the same thing here with z2 times z2 okay you yeah, yeah, yeah. change with z2 I think okay. it's called the xyz model I think you even worked on the xyz model it's an integrable system yeah 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 so if you no, so right, you need two z2s though at least but not yeah. one we need at least two z2s yeah. And with two Z2s, all of this works. And this had yeah. been done before us. So what is that? I think Oshikawa did it. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah, what these, people, like these people, these people did the Z2 times Z2 and the this is O2. This is a mistake. Yeah. Yeah. So these people worked it out in here first. They did not quite phrase it in this language, but what they did can be translated step by step, can be translated to this to this language. Okay. Okay, well, thanks very much. That was really clear. Thank you. And hearing it from you means a lot to me. <laughs> Thank you. So it seems there are no more questions. Uh, let's thank Nati uh, for this nice talk again and for a very nice round of discussions. Thank you very much for coming here. Thank you. Thank we'll you.